any picture. You kept saying to yourself, I hope I got it right, I hope I got it right, I hope I got it right. I didn't think we'd use the picture because we would be past that line. But when I saw the picture, I knew we had to use it. I've seen that picture just about every day of my life since it was taken, and it still gives me goosebumps. I had no idea it would be the picture that went around the world. When I was a kid, downtown was my playground. We played downtown, we, we worked downtown. But for most kids back then, it's fair to say it was more work than play. Rocco Morabito was the kid who sold papers on the corner, a Jacksonville Journal newsboy at age nine, and that was in 1929. You look great for 87. Looks are deceiving. <laughs> paper sold for a nickel, you made two and a half cents on the paper you sold. You sold ten papers, where you make a quarter? So on a really good day, Rocco might sell 40 papers and make a whole buck. And during the Depression, a dollar a day wasn't bad. Trouble is, there weren't enough of those days. People who didn't have anything didn't have anything, period. And then, Jacksonville's great escape from the Depression. World War II. Rocco joined the Army Air Corps' famed 92nd Bomb Group, age 22. He flew 34 missions over Europe as a ball turret gunner. The guy down there, in the glass bubble. Of course, you prayed a little, quite a bit. He was frightened, freezing, and so cramped he was forced to fire from a fetal position, his face 30 inches from the armored glass. He had the B-17's worst crew position. I was little. <laughs> All the little guys wound up in the ball. And even then, he was taking pictures, sort of. We had gun cameras. We followed the bombs down to where they were going, took pictures of all that. You had to be glad when the war was over. Well, weren't we all? When Rocco got back home, he went back to the place that hired him at age nine, but his old boss, mindful of Rocco's terrifying war adventures, assumed he might want some R&R. &R. He says, how much time you want off? You want about three months, two months? Okay. I was back there two weeks wanting to go to work. Rocco did everything at the Journal, and lots of it. Sweated in the dark room, covered the prep sports, and then... We had a, a opening in the photo department. And, uh, and they said, well, how'd you like to be a photographer? You know, he wasn't a photographer, but he became a photographer, and he became a great photographer. Uh, he just had a knack. One early assignment, though down and dirty, was plum and profitable. So I started going out, and I would shoot wrecks, and they used them. So they were paying me $3 a picture. So heck, I was doing pretty good. And somewhere between shooting wrecks and covering preps, he had a cup of coffee with Sophia. Then I got to thinking, I said, well, now, I'll give her a call, you know, I'd like maybe I'd like to know her. Apparently, she felt the same way. Rocco and Sophia married in 1952. And we'll guess that this is probably his all-time favorite picture the one he didn't take. Rocco would never make this claim, but as a journal photographer, he became kind of a local celebrity. His name certainly made the paper more than the mayor's, and even the governor's. His photographs, whether a ball game, a debutante ball, or a bawling baby, were as much a part of the journal as Dear Abby or Little Abner. This one, known by his colleagues as Rocco's Rabbit, actually got into Life magazine. But at the paper, he was just one of the guys, a very popular figure. Rocco was just such a decent person. That's the, that's the word that describes him, decent. As the 50s and 60s rolled by, the rolls of film added up, along with 15, 20, 30,000 Rocco Morabito pictures, 
Maybe more. No one really knows. Not even Tina, his oldest daughter, captured here in rare form. But of one thing, she's certain. He's an old-time newspaper man. He's going to get his picture. I don't care if the police or the federal agents or whoever says he can't. He's going to get it. If he can't get a good shot, he's going to climb a water tower or go up in a cherry picker or hang off the side of a building. He's done incredible things. You can't believe the things he's done to get pictures. And then it was July 17, 1967. Flip through the paper and a Goodyear tire was 15 bucks. And on TV that night, Gilligan's Island was in its original run. Tonight's episode was the one where they almost got off the island. Looking back superficially, it all sounds so benign, even charming. But look closer, and it's easy to see why it was hardly the summer of love in Jacksonville. Instead, it was a city still reeling from Hurricane Dora, still dealing and fumbling with the $100 million in damage she did three years earlier. A city disgraced after revelations of corruption at City Hall, a grand jury indicts 11 officials. A city humiliated when all of its public high schools lose accreditation. So many pictures you saw during those days were fighting and bloodshed and people hurting people and people protesting in this country. And so it was nice to see something where people put aside all their differences and it was just one person helping someone else. It sounds pretty ordinary, one person helping someone else. But on July 17th, 1967, Rocco Morabito would show that the ordinary could be extraordinary. What he shot that day for the journal would stun the world. <laughs> 